church online service you're welcome to come as you are you can watch lift inside or out you can eat your breakfast during the service or have a cuppa on the couch take a break if you've been working join us whether you've just woken up have enjoyed some puzzle fun or already been for a run enjoy the service
welcome to our online service this morning. We're so glad that you've joined us. Though we are not physically together, it is our desire as a church that we stay connected. If you are interested in joining one of our online small groups, please email us at info at liftchurch.com.au. And now, let's worship together and then join Pastor Greg for a great message of hope. Hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I'll raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I'll raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I'll raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Oh, 
Lord Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire The darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every Of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after me When my life lay down I'm surrender now I give you
darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle work, a promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Lord, we thank you that you are a way maker. God, that you make a way and we trust you by faith. Church, I just want to encourage you this morning as we finish our worship here. In Hebrews chapter 11, the author writes this. He says in verse 1, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what our ancestors, the ancients, were commended for. And then in verse 6, it says, And Without faith, it is impossible. Come on, say impossible. It is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. This morning, I want to pray into you. Uh, I pray, God, that there would be just a supernatural injection of faith. We are people of faith. And... Uh, and we live by faith, not by sight. And so this morning, I want to encourage you. Maybe you're waning in your faith. Maybe you don't see the miracles. Maybe you don't see the light in the darkness. But can I remind you that God, God does. And we, by faith, trust and believe that He will make miracles. He'll make a way. He will do what He needs to do because He is a way maker. So join me in prayer this morning. So Father God, we thank you, God, for your miracle working power. And Lord, I trust and believe by faith, God, that you even right now are working miracles. You are making a way, God. You are lighting the way, that, that you are bringing your light into dark areas. And God, this morning, I inject, I inject and pray and inject a supernatural faith into those watching and listening to me this morning, God. Invade every home and every heart, God, with your faith, Lord, and build our faith, Lord, that we can trust and see, God, that you will make a way for us where we don't see a way, God. God, we commit our prayer, our time, our worship to you, Lord, and we thank you. Lord, I pray for every healing heart. I pray for every home here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, good morning, good morning. Welcome to our uh, service this morning. It's great to have you. My name is Pastor Greg, and however you found us on the World Wide Web, or maybe you're watching a replay of our YouTube, hey, we're glad that you have joined in with us. Uh, we're going to have a great morning this morning. We are continuing our Healthy Homes series and, uh, and I just want to tell you about next week and I want you to make sure you tune in. Next week is going to be a lot of fun. In fact, we are interviewing three or four families within uh, Lift Church and just talking to them about what it means to them to have a healthy home, what they're working on, what they're, what they're winning or maybe losing with and want to improve on. You know, we're not going for per perfection, but what we are going for is health. And uh, I think you're going to be encouraged just by hearing some other stories. So definitely tune in to that. It's going to be great. And uh, before I share our message this morning, I just want to kind of give a bit of an update. A bit of an update is what is happening with church and our COVID lockdown as the government slowly begins to lift restrictions. You know, it may be it may be a long time or it could happen within a week, you know, when all of a sudden we're back together joining and worshiping. And uh, I know many of you have enjoyed this time. I certainly have, but I've also missed the opportunity to gather corporately gather together as a church body um, and I'll, I'll tell you why I've missed it not that I you know because I haven't seen your faces or whatever but I think there is for me and and I believe for the church there's great power 
when we corporately gather together. People ask, well, why do we, why do we need buildings? Why do we need to worship? Because there's something powerful about our corporate faith. Uh, not our individual faith, but our corporate faith, our, our collective faith. When we gather together, I think there is, there's immense power because I can tap into your faith and you can tap into my faith and collectively we can encourage and build one another and believe for great things. So there's power when we gather corporately. But also we can encourage one another. Um, you know, by yourself, you can't, you, you know, it's hard to encourage yourself, but it's powerful when others, uh, when we gather, just being in their presence can encourage us. And, and can I remind you, you know, though we might enjoy this isolation and being in our homes and stuff, uh, that's great for you, but what about for others? You know, I think as a Christ follower, we're always thinking about others and, and and how can we serve others and how can we help others and how can we encourage others well you can do that when we gather together corporately because it encourages people that you might not even know need the encouragement they want to see your smiling face they want to you know i don't know if we'll be able to shake hands but they want to be able to just say hello and chat and talk um, not over Zoom or a FaceTime, but in person, it, it really is powerful. So, you know, at some point we will gather together again, and uh, I'm really, really looking forward to that because there's a purpose in why we gather. In fact, that's one of our values. Uh, we, we intentionally, on purpose, gather because there's power in it. So I look forward to that time. I'm not sure when it's going to be. The government's going to dictate that and when it's safe. And we will do that. I'm looking forward to when that happens. And so we'll be ready to pull the trigger. And, and uh, I know many of you are looking forward to when we gather together. We've, we've enjoyed this time, but we're also looking forward to getting together as the church and, and worshiping together and singing our praises. And where two or three are gathered, there Jesus is in his midst. So when we gather in his name, he is there encouraging, enabling through the Holy Spirit, all of us. So I definitely look forward to that. Some things will stay the same. Uh, some things will go back to different. We'll, there'll be a new normal and uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to continuing our online services. Uh, we're in fact even making plans for that as we speak right now. So uh, I think it's going to be good. It won't go completely back to normal. Some things will, uh, but I think we'll add in some things uh, that can enhance our faith and our church. So I'm really looking forward, really looking forward to that. All right, let me pray. I want to share with you another message uh, around our healthy homes. So Father, we thank you. God, for your word, Lord, I pray that this morning, those listening who um, hear the word of God, God, that, it would, um, that they would receive it, that it would change us in our heart, that we would be different, that we would be more like you, God. We thank you for your word in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Well, our series, this Healthy Homes series, which we've been in for now six weeks, and, and uh, I hope your home's growing. I hope, it, I hope it's getting healthier. Um, the scripture is found in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 24, verses 3 and 4. And it says this, By wisdom a house is built, and through understanding it is established. Through knowledge its rooms are filled with, with rare and beautiful treasures. And we've been building our homes, our, our houses, uh, our families over these weeks. And today we're going to be talking about wisdom. It says, by wisdom a house is built. And we're going to talk about building wisdom into our homes in some certain areas. And I'll share with that in a few minutes. But have you ever had the thought, or maybe you've been watching your family or looking at other families, and just and never had the thought in, in terms of just 
how did we get here? How did time fly? How did for us, you know, 20 years of marriage fly by? And how, how did we get there? I've, I've caught myself in different times while I'm, you know, daydreaming or thinking or pondering or meditating, you know, how did we get here? And, and am I happy with where we're at? Or did I think we would be exactly where we're at? And usually, you know, it, it's not. I didn't think we'd be here. There were some twists and turns that I didn't anticipate. Uh, you know, but I wonder, you know, how did we get here? Or, or maybe you're asking within your family, how, how, how did your family end up like it is? Whether good or bad, whether growing or not. How, how did your family end up here? What decisions did you make that led you to where you are at? Or or maybe you're asking the question as you look at other families, and I have done this uh, in pastoral care and different things when you're caring for families, especially ones that are going through a crisis, you wonder how in the world did they end up in this place? How did they, how did a family get divorced? How, how come they're in financial ruin? Why are the siblings uh, and the family members not talking to each other? How, how did this family end up in crisis? How did, how did they get into the ditch? What, what was it that, were there a, a, a bunch of decisions? Was it one decision? How did they get to this place? Because the reality is nobody plans to be in a ditch. No family plans to be divorced. It's not something they thought about on their wedding day and says, you know, I'm going to love you forever and until death do us part. And, 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 and at that time, there, there was no plan for divorce, but, but it happens. Nobody hopes that they can be financially ruined and, and drowning in debt. It, it's not a plan of anybody. It, it, it's not a personal goal to to grow up and never speak to your family. Never speak to your family. But there are families and homes all over Australia, all over Australia in situations like this. They found their home in ruins. They found themselves in a ditch. And they often ask the question, how in the world did we get here? You know, I believe to have a healthy home and to avoid the ditches, uh, and to avoid driving off the road, you know, our homes need guardrails. Our homes need guardrails. And, and uh, today I want to speak to you about, about guardrails, putting guardrails in your home. You're, but, but first let me start with what, what, what are guardrails? Now, you probably know, like I do, guardrails are, are designed to keep vehicles from straying off into dangerous and off-limit areas. They're there to minimize the damage by keeping us in the safety zone, in the lanes. They, they help to minimize the damage. In fact, guardrails direct and protect. They protect us and direct us. And, and guardrails are placed in the safety zone. You know, you find guardrails on the road, you find them on curves, uh, because sometimes, you know, the roads are dangerous. And if you're driving too fast on a curved road, I mean, you could end up in Lake Macquarie, you know, if you're going around, around the lake. You know, there, there are guardrails positioned there because if you've never driven on that and you think you can go 110 kilometers an hour, you're going to be in trouble. So there's guardrails in there and signs and different things. You know, you find them on curves on roads. You find them on bridges. You find them on bridges. And it's obvious because, you know, when it's a 100 meter drop off, you, you know, you don't want to be driving without a guardrail. You want some protection in the safety zone so that you don't go off a cliff. But we also find guardrails in, in the median, in, on the median, because it helps to protect us from going on to oncoming traffic or oncoming traffic into us. It's there to protect us. You know, the reason guardrails 
are a part of the driving landscape is because I don't know if you know this, but driving is hazardous to your health. It's hazardous to your health. I mean, if, if you've ever helped an L plater learn to drive, you will understand this concept. See, you know, I, I take it for second nature to, to drive now, but my son just not long ago had to take his L's and, uh, and started learning. And as I jumped in the passenger seat with him behind the wheel, I realized very quickly and it came rushing back to me that the driving is pretty hazardous. It's scary, especially when you don't feel like you have control. I mean, you realize that all of a sudden your 16 year old is in a car, your 17 year old is in a car and it is a lethal weapon. It's a weapon. And driving even though it might be second nature to you and I that we've done it for so long, for a new driver, it is complicated. It is scary. There's so many things that you've got to think about. It's complicated. And the roads and drivers are unpredictable. They, they are unpredictable. And what I have found, if you're not careful and intentional, and you're not paying attention, cars, especially with learner drivers, tend to drift. They drift into the other lanes and they wander and veer and, and you know, you're constantly thinking, you know, grab the, grab the wheel and pull them back into line. You're drifting over and you're in the other lane and, and driving is hazardous to your health. And many of you might experience this when some of yours, your, um, your children start to grow up and you have to start to learn, teach them to drive. Well, the same case, the same is the case for families and homes. Homes need guardrails because building a healthy home is complicated. It's difficult. And the people in your home are unpredictable. Homes drift if you're not intentional. Families veer off track like the car veers slowly into the other lane. Families do the same. Families do the same. And we can find ourselves in a ditch that we never anticipated or planned for if, we're not, if we don't on purpose put some guardrails in our homes like are on the highways because everyone drifts to their detriment. Everyone drifts towards their detriment and homes are no different. Families are no different. They drift and all of a sudden we find ourselves, how in the world did we get here? I didn't plan for this. You know, I, I, I believe healthy homes need guardrails. They need barriers set in place on purpose to help us stay in the, on the right path that God has for every single one of your families and mine. The problem is we don't use wisdom to place the guardrails in our homes. What we tend to do is let society tell us. We kind of model what others do. We do what we feel is best, what's convenient, what's easy, instead of using wisdom to build our house, wisdom to set guardrails. And then when we've driven off the road and our family is fragmented and fractured, we wish we would have placed the guardrails in different areas. See, it's wisdom that builds a house, not feelings. It's wisdom that makes a home. It's, it's not what is popular. It's wisdom that anchors a home, not just hoping or guessing like we're on our L plates. Let me read you here some scripture. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. It says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that appears 
that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Then again, it says it in Proverbs 16, 25. It must be important. It says there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. In the end, it veers off into a ditch. It seems like we're going in the right direction, but, but we're drifting. And in the end, it leads to death. It leads to a ditch. In Judges 21, verse 25, it says, In those days, Israel had no king. This is the end of Judges. And everyone d- did what they saw fit. You see, when we govern ourselves, when you govern your life and, and, and you don't let a king rule over you, everyone will do see as they see fit. And, and it might be good, but it might not be wise. So in my remaining time, I want to talk to you about how to set up guardrails in your house so that, so that maybe, you're not, maybe you're heading in the right track, maybe your family's going, going great and your marriage is going great, but, but you're heading in the wrong, the wrong direction and, and uh, you, maybe you're veering slightly and you don't even realize it. I want to talk to you about guardrails. Where should we put them? I mean, what, what are good guardrails? But first, let me start. We must use wisdom as our guide. Wisdom has to be our guide, not the world or their standards, not feelings or convenience, but wisdom. And wisdom says this, we've, we've used this before and previously in previous messages, but wisdom says this, based on my past experience, present circumstances, and future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? What's the wise thing to do? Based on my past experience, and my present circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams for my family, what's the wise thing to do when it, when it comes to guardrails in my family, in my home, in my marriage? Where do we put them? Where do we place them? Well, firstly, if you understand guardrails on a highway, we place them in the safe zone, not in the danger zone. Guardrails are always in the safe zone. They're not up against the cliff. They're in fact, they're back from the cliff. So if we inadvertently cross the guardrail, so if we mess up, if, if, if we fail, if we, if we cross a line, hopefully it's going to cause minimal damage as possible. Now we don't have physical guardrails in our homes. We do on the road and when you bump into a guardrail it might cause a bit of a dent in your fender, but you haven't driven off the cliff because it's in the safe zone. The same is in our home. We don't have, we might not have physical guardrails, but we've got these boundaries, these barriers that we say, you know what, we're not going to cross here. And if we do, if we bump over the guardrail, it's going to cause minimal damage. It won't cause us to be in the ditch or completely off track. See, what areas of our homes need guardrails? What areas of our home need guardrails? And this is where I want to encourage you to take inventory. Take stock of your home and begin to think, what areas of our home could we veer off track if we don't have some wise guardrails in place. Now, I would argue you need them in every area. In every area, a home needs guardrails. But let me give you some examples. Let me give you some examples. For example, uh, when it comes to communicating and the dialogue and the words, and, and last week, you know, I preached a message about our words in our home, and I won't go back and rehash that. You can go and watch some of that, but there needs to be guardrails even when it comes to the dialogue and and the language in our home. You know, some of the guardrails that you might set up is is that there's no absolutes. So in our home, we're not going to say never and always because 
because if we if when we cross those lines then all of a sudden we begin to think oh gosh if we're saying always and you never then we negate all the other times the 99 percent of the times or the 50 percent of the times that somebody has and did do because when we say absolutes when we when we begin to say the nevers and always all of a sudden people in the home begin to say well what about you know i think to myself well what about the time i did and what about the other times it's not always and i think about the times that I have and all of a sudden it just slowly veers our family off track because the dialogue is using absolutes and so maybe a guardrail in your home would be no absolutes maybe a guardrail in your home is that there's no name calling kids I'm talking to you um, husband wife you know uh, that there's no name calling, you know, because, because it could be a guardrail because oftentimes when we're angry, when we're emotional, when we're hurt, all of a sudden we want to get back at someone. We want them to feel like we do. And the only way that we can do it is, is we make a personal attack. But let that be a guardrail in your home. That's so when we're upset and angry and fighting or or whatever it is that that we're just not going to go there it's a guardrail so that it doesn't let our our family veer or wander into a ditch that could be debilitating what about when it comes to children and if you have children in your home some of you they're empty nesters and they've left but but what about in when it comes to children, what are the guardrails you have in your home for your kids, for your children? Maybe when it comes to sleepovers, what, what are the barriers? What are the parameters? What are the lines that you're not willing to cross? Is it a certain age? Is it with certain families? Is it different things? I'll, I'll tell you one thing that we did for a long time when it came to sleepovers. We would not let, let our kids, and, and uh, this was 99% of the time. Sometimes we did break the rule because we were, the, we were allowed to, but, but um, we set barriers about not having sleepovers till certain ages. And we also set guardrails in this area that if somebody had an older teenage boy or girl uh, we would probably in most of the times we would not do sleepovers now was it bad no did we think something was going to happen to them no they could have been great people but working with teenagers working with kids all my life you know what older boys older girls are exposed to more things they might be doing things, they might be uh, involved in things that I just didn't want my kids susceptible to, my younger kids. And so when they were seven or eight or different ages, whatever Stacey and I had decided, I didn't want them sleeping over at their house. So we just set some guardrails, we set some parameters, barriers that, that we were not going to cross. And, and uh, was anything bad going to happen? Probably not. Probably not, but we set the barriers in the safe zone and we just said, based on our past experiences, based on our current circumstances, and based on our future hopes and dreams that we have for our children, we're just not going to do sleepovers at the moment. It was, it was a guardrail that we decided to put in place because we didn't want something happening to them at seven, eight, nine years old. You know, and in extreme cases, you know, the, I've, I've heard many of us of, of older siblings abusing, uh, sexually abusing kids or peop, younger siblings or different things. And uh, not that we know anyone that that had happened to, but we just wanted to set the guardrail in our home for our children. You know, what are the guardrails when it comes to movies 
and games and their ratings and different things. What, what parameters will you set based on your past experiences, your current circumstances, and your future hopes and dreams? What's the wise thing to do, parents? How, what do you do when it comes to technology? What are the barriers? What are the guardrails that you're going to put in place? Will you place them in the safe zone? So if they cross over the line, there's going to be minimal damage. Minimal damage. What about financially as a home and as a family? What barriers, what guardrails do you set in place? You know, I would encourage you, you know, it, it, do you have a savings plan? Do you save a certain percentage? It's a great guardrail. Um, how are you going to handle debt and credit cards? What, what's your guardrail? Are you going to pay off the credit card? Are you, are you not going to take out the extra loan because you've still got the other debts? Um, I mean, what are the guardrails? Because no one plans to be in financial ruin but they veer off there. They drift to it because they've not set guardrails around their finances. Budgets can be a guardrail if you stick to it. You know, tithing and giving is a guardrail to, to protect you, to veer off. So to not let you veer off. And what about in your marriage? What are the guardrails? What's the wise thing to do based on your past experiences, your current circumstances, and your future hopes and dreams when it comes to your marriage? What are the guardrails that you might put in place? Take inventory, take stock. I can't tell you what that is, but can I tell you, you've got to do it wisely. A guardrail might be making sure that you have a date night. Uh, it might be that when you're fighting that, uh, or you're having um, aggressive conversation that, that you don't go to, go to bed without making up. And can I tell you, making up's the fun part. All right, I'll move on from that. But, but what, what's the guardrail for you? What's the guardrail at work when it comes to work colleagues and and uh, work trips and the opposite sex and different things. What are the guardrails? Uh, if you don't have them, you can find yourself in a ditch. Not that you plan to be there, but because we veer and drift. All of us drift to our detriment. And our homes need guardrails, even spiritually. Spiritually. So that we don't veer off out of the will of God drifting away from God, but rather than driving intentionally to God. You know, guardrails for us in our family is serving. We will serve. We will serve people because it helps me drift towards God because I realize that Christ came to serve and not be served. A guardrail for us is attending church always because I want to be uh, contributor. I want to be around people uh, that are faith filled and I want to build God's church here on earth. Uh, it's a guardrail for us. And so, you know, we don't let other things encroach into it because we've set that guardrail. I, I said for us, tithing is a guardrail for us. Small groups, being involved in small groups, prayer, reading the Bible. These are all guardrails that we've put in place so that we don't drift off track. Now, I must warn you, if you set guardrails as a family, as a, as a family, as a husband and wife, uh, you know, in different areas of your life, I'm, I'm just going to warn you, you might not be the most popular family on the block. I mean, people might think you're weird or even extreme. What do you mean? No sleepovers. What do you mean you tithe? You give money. What do you mean you serve? What do you mean you have a date night? You know, every week? I mean, really? That's a little extreme. You know, society might think it's a little extreme and a little weird. And they probably won't fully understand. 
and you have to be willing to say, it's okay. They don't understand. Based on your past experiences, your current circumstance, and your future hopes and dreams, when you make wise choices based around that, people will misunderstand you. They will characterize you. They might label you. They might think you're a little weird. And can I just say, you know what? It's okay. It's okay. Because the guardrails are going to keep you on track, keep you out of the ditch, keep your family from drifting. See, healthy homes, healthy families, healthy relationships, healthy marriages, anything healthy has guardrails to keep it on track. And so I want to encourage you with, with faith, with strength, with courage, with direction, with wisdom, with the voice of the Holy Spirit, set guardrails in your home. Set them so that we don't veer off track, so we don't find ourselves down the highway of life in five, ten years in a ditch that we never planned for because no one planned for it. But we can live a life and build a family of no regrets when we when, when we put guardrails in our homes. So as I close, trust God, use wisdom, and build a healthy home. Let me pray with you. Lord Jesus, I pray for every home. Lord, I ask your Holy Spirit that you would just nudge and, and, and speak to every heart listening to the sound of my voice, to listening to this message. Help them make wise choices when it comes to their home. Help them make wise decisions when they're putting guardrails and parameters and boundaries in their home. Lord, I pray that you would build every home to be healthy, strong, and vibrant. And just nudge us where we're veering off track. Help us bring us back into alignment, into your will, by your spirit, God. Lord, I pray for every home. Lord, I thank you. May you bless every home, every family, every marriage in Jesus' name. And while every head is bowed, every eye closed, just don't, don't be moving around. Don't be rushing off just yet. I want to pray for those maybe that are listening here that have that maybe you're searching in your faith and, and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. You, you, in fact, like the car, you've been driving and today you want to hand over the steering wheel of your life to Jesus. You can do this through a simple, through a simple prayer of faith. And if that's you, I want you to pray with me. And in our chat box, you can... You can, in fact, even let one of our hosts know that you made a decision for Christ. But say this with me. Everyone listening, say, Dear Jesus, today I commit my life to you. I'm tired of driving and I give you the steering wheel of my life. Forgive me of my sins. I thank you that you're giving me a brand new future on this earth and in eternity by committing my life to you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Can't wait to see you and look forward to speaking with you next week. Thanks for joining us online today. This ministry is made possible through the generosity of people just like you. You can make a financial contribution online via our website, or you can also click the giving tab at the top of the screen. Although we find ourselves in a difficult season, we are actually excited to expand the reach of Lift Church right now through the limitless possibilities that technology can bring. Collectively, we all provide the finances, the expertise, and the creativity that is needed. So why don't you pray, believe, and give so we can continue to expand.